So, how many of you, uh, you know, while reading your textbooks, have actually realized that every paragraph that you read, every keyword that you read, is actually a work of many brilliant minds from the past? You know, it's a common observation for me that most of us fail to acknowledge that the comforts that we have in our day-to-day -day lives were actually gifts from brilliant minds from the past. You know, a possible explanation is because the innovations that we have are so common to us. It has become merely like a commodity. Let me put a small example before you all so that it will be much easier for us to understand what exactly I'm speaking about. Let me get to this example of alternate current. Alternate current has become such a simple thing for us. It, it has become a part and parcel of our life that we often fail to acknowledge its present around, presence around us, right? So, why is it so? It is possibly because it has become as simple as a commodity. But remember, in developing an alternate current as a technology and in establishing it globally, like for example, transmission of alternate current or let's say reduction of resistance while transmitting it, local storage of it, etc. There are several other possibilities of using and generation of alternate current which has consumed works of brilliant minds, thousands of minds. So, what I want to say is the commodity inventions that we see on day-to-day -day basis were actually the works of centuries of efforts and decades of trials. Do you agree with me or not? Yes. We bring a lot of heritage, a great, great minds of the past with us right now. So it literally means that, for, for example, the meeting that we are having right now, of course I cannot see you, obvious, for, for obvious reasons that you guys are in dark when compared to what I am. But you know, for these lights to be active, for this mic to be working, for the speakers to be working, for the people watching on YouTube, the YouTube or the telecommunications, the software, etc. These were all developed by several thousand, several millions of people across the past few centuries. And that means that currently we are sitting on the works of millions of people from the past. Do you agree with me or not? So, when we have these kind of comforts, which we have received from the past, from our ancestral brilliance, what is that we are going to do to the future? When we acknowledge that every paragraph, every keyword that we read in our textbooks were actually works from our past, are we going to add at least a single keyword or a paragraph or a chapter for us in our textbooks? This is the quest that made me into a scientist that I am right now today. I am Praveen Kumar Gorakavi, a multi-award winner scientist inventor from Hyderabad, India. I have I have commercialized more than 30 technologies in coordination or partnership with various companies across the globe. And every day, my works touch the lives of 1 million people on every day basis. I am very proud to be at this point. Uh, this is just a beginning. Let me tell you how my journey has actually started. I started my career when I was 13 years old. You know, when I was 13 or before that, I used to do a lot of craft items. I used to develop certain things which were obviously of my interest. And when I was 13, I have developed few mathematical equations with which I have developed 40,000 years of calendar, which was a world record. For, for, for science students or for engineers right now, it might look so absurd that 40,000 years do a program, you'll get that. But no, that, that is not what I have done back then. There are different types of calendars that we in India itself use. So I brought 32 different types of calendars and made it on a single platform that is my calendar for 40,000 years. And then, <laughs> please save your energy because I have many inventions to speak about. <laughs> and uh, yeah, coming back to the point, I have also converted 30,000 years of that calendar into braille screens for visually handicapped people. From there on, thank you so much. From there on, 
whatever invention or project I was working on has got a national importance thanks to the media, thanks to different teachers, different mentors I have and I am very blessed to have my parents who helped me all along. So, the very next innovation after doing this calendar was a missile technology, an ammunition technology. We all know we are using fuel for our vehicles, right? I have designed a propellant at the age of 14 which was given to the Indian Defense. I was talking about the missile technology that I have done. Soon after ammunition technology, I have developed world's low cost artificial limb, a prosthetics for handicapped people. That is two records actually, world's low cost and world's low weight. And currently around 20,000 20, people are using this across the country. Besides this, there were several innovations that I have been doing because my idea is always something like we are sitting on the work of so many people and we have to develop something for the next generation. This has been my motive all the time, all the time. So I was carrying my cats on one side and on the other side, I was totally focused on making my own chapter in the textbooks I am going to read. But there was one moment uh, during my uh, doctoral studies. I have realized that, you know, if we can understand the entire chronological evolution of science and technology in, a, in the sense of states. So we are actually having a base which was created by our previous people and now we are laying next steps to the other people. I realized that the states as we go up are actually becoming narrower and narrower. Seriously. I will tell you how exactly I am coming up. There are very good innovations coming up in the market. Just like I am doing, there are a lot of research institutes or corporates or startups which are uh, very much actively engaged in doing research in order to create new products. But what about the people coexisting with us? Are we able to develop a technology which is reaching almost everyone along with us? No, the answer should be absolute no. Right? I'll tell you an example. We have 5G communications coming at one part of the country, of the globe. Whereas, several countries are still still struggling for the application of 3G or 4G. We are talk, talking about robotic surgeries on one side, where we are not able to afford a CT scanner or a low cost, uh, let's say, MRI in a rural parts of India or other places. We were talking about hyperloop, whereas we do not have a first bullet train running in India. There are several difficulties, several inequalities. This is what the world is right now. Probably, probably in my personal opinion, I feel that probably for the first time in the mankind, we have an excessive infusion of technologies into an unprepared market. You know, whenever you see news, you see about Hyperloop, or you see about reusable rockets, or you, you see about self-driven cars, or they, promote this as the next gen technologies, etc. So people come to me and ask me like, Iska kya zarurat hai? why do we need this? Serious. But you know, in my personal opinion, uska zarurat hai. we do need those kind of technology because unless we contribute something to the existing or the next generations, there will not be any progression or any evolution in science and technology. But at the same time, we should also look at people who are coexisting with us. Like the examples I have mentioned to you, there are several good technologies which are not being able to uh, reach different kinds of sectors just because of socio-economic conditions. How sad it is. You know, because people like me, when we stand behind a design desk and when we try to develop certain products, we dream about serving billions and billions of people with those technologies. But how far is it reaching? You know, when the product or when a design passes the uh, design bench and then it goes to the prototype and other, other, other things, there are a lot of different additions that happen to our technology and that will increase the price or uh, it, will, it will, let's say, increase the uh, difficulty in applying this technology to different people. That is exactly another core science, another core field of uh, interest. So, I will put this straight in one word. What I mean to say is, when there is more and more amount of technologies or companies 
flowing in, developing new products, I think there is an equivalent amount of opportunity <coughs> growing for the new companies or startups to develop ways in order to enhance the applicability of this technology. You know, saying all this, I wanted to say about my motive. No person in the entire globe, whether they are from Kenya, whether they are from rural parts of India, or any part in that sense, should, should, they should never be deprived of a technology based on their socio-economic conditions. I will give you an example. If you hold a 20,000 rupees watch, that is still fine. Or if you have a 20,000 rupee cell phone, that is still fine. If the other guy is having 200 rupee cell phone or 2,000 rupee cell phone and he is still able to communicate, that is fine. That is not the condition, that is not a case we are discussing here. But there are cases where there is no electricity to charge your cell phones. Like the examples I was saying, there is 5G communication on one side where there is no 3G or 4G communication on the other side. We are talking about alternate current being so common to us, whereas we still do not have uh, you know, uh, power supply to a lot of people, uninterrupted power supply. It's also a case in India and some, of, some parts of the world. We still do not have a proper drinking water facility to a lot of people. This is exactly where people have to start thinking. Especially for us, as I told you, when we are going up in the ladder of evolution of science and technology, the world, the world is turning narrower and narrower. In a rush to progress upwards, we are leaving many people behind. So I personally ad admire the philosophy that technology is a fundamental right and I advocate to most of the people and also all the engineers here who are willing to have their own career in science or to start their own startups do consider this. It is not just creating new technologies. That is one branch of science and technology. It is also working on the existing technology, how to apply existing technologies. This is what I do at my research center for Key Factory in Hyderabad. We develop three commercial innovations. For every three commercialized innovations, we do one social innovation. When I say social innovation, I'm not just talking about uh, an innovation which is being carried by rural area people in rural areas. But it is actually applying something that we know very well to the people who really deserve it. I would also like to give you a small example. I have recently developed a braille typewriter. You know, blind students, they communicate in a language called braille. So there is this common definition for literacy. We say literacy as the ability to read or write. But for a blind student, in, a, in order to make his speech on a paper, he needs a braille typewriter, which means his ability to read or write, which means his literacy rate, his or her literacy rate is in the hands of people like us. There is an equipment, there are many equipments to print braille, but they are very, very expensive. The nearest or the lowest is somewhere close to $650. And it's around 5.5 kgs. That's a mechanical typewriter which I'm talking about. I have designed a mechanical typewriter, which is almost <coughs> one-sixth of the price of it. And now we are rolling it into market from Kenya. So, friends, I just wanted to tell you this. Being a scientist, is, is a beautiful thing because you actually have, a, have an ability to create something new and to pass on something new to the society, to the next generations. In the same way, let us also consider the people who are coexisting with us and let us try to make technologies more affordable, not just by reducing its cost, but also by improvising its uh, supply chain or by also improvising its production capacity or any other possible ways in that matter. So, thank you. This is Pravin Gorakavi.